everyone, I'm Libby Hopoff. I'm the Program Manager and Audiovisual Archivist for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound, or MEPOPS, and I'm also the Audiovisual Archivist for the Seattle Municipal Archives. Hi, my name is Andrew Weaver, and I'm the Media Preservation Librarian at UW Libraries here in Seattle, Washington. And I'm Dave Rice. I'm the co-chair of the EMEA Open Source Committee. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Meepops and the University of Washington are located on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish tribes, past and present, and honor with gratitude the waters and land itself, along with the peoples and cultures that have existed here since time immemorial and continue thriving here today. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we are on. Welcome to our final EMEA project update for DB Rescue. In this presentation, we will demonstrate the current development status of DB Rescue tools, summarize project conclusions, and describe future work for digital videotape preservation. Funded by a research and development grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, DB Rescue is a set of tools designed for preserving archival videotape in DB formats. Over the past two years, this project has developed procedures and tools that support migrating data from DB tapes into digital files suitable for long-term preservation. This has helped fill an urgent need for DB tape transfer tools that can rescue content from at-risk digital videotape formats. Components include transfer analysis, file packaging and merging, as well as assistance and guidance. The analysis section of our GUI is what shaped up first. This interface depicts a timeline of a DV file and shows the rate of video and audio errors over that timeline along with recording events such as start and stop markers and jumps in the timestamps or the timecode. This interface basically depicts the XML that we store behind the scenes that documents the transfer event or the evaluation of a DV file. This interface shows three ways of interacting with that DV data about the transfer. There's a player, a table of data about interesting frames, and a graph. Uh, the interface is designed to keep all three of these components in sync, so a highlight will follow along the graph or the table according to what frame is shown in the player. When the tape is read inside the deck, uh, it's read by a drum of two readers, one on each side. Since the tape transfer errors can be sorted by which reader they came from, our graphs are centered with errors uh, coming from one reader plotted upwards and errors coming from the other reader plotted downwards. This helps clarify which, uh, if the errors were because of an issue on the tape, where the errors would be distributed equally across, uh, between both readers, or if the errors were because of a deck issue, where like one of the readers was clogged and produced something like a, a head clog. Uh, in the frame table, we also show information like the embedded time code, the recording timestamp, and the properties of the file, like if it, the properties of the frame, such as the aspect ratio and the audio channel characteristics. Part of our approach for capturing DV data from a tape to a file is to receive each frame, frame by frame, and write it continuously to a single file, even if the characteristics of these frames change. For instance, we may capture a DV tape even though the uh, audio changes from 48 kilohertz to 32 kilohertz per second or it could change from four channels of audio to two channels of audio and back. Or the aspect ratio could change between 4, 3, and 16 by 9. Capturing tapes as continuous data streams, regardless of changing characteristics, helps us avoid the old issue of a capture stopping at every change or timecode break, like Final Cut 7 or Premiere it used to do. And this makes it easier to transfer all of the data from a DV tape into a file in its entirety, despite those potential changes. However, this creates an interoperability and playback issue, as many players don't well support variable aspect ratio or variable sample rate. So in the DB Rescue project, our focus on packaging is working to address the issues of storing an unprocessed data stream known as a .dv file. Uh, we use the term packaging to mean encapsulating that DV data stream into a container format such as QuickTime or Matroska. In a format like this, the characteristics of potentially broken or inconsistent DV files read from a tape may be expressed with more clarity. Moving a DV data stream uh, into a container also lets us use features of that container to make the content more convenient and accessible. For instance, in addition to the video and audio, a DV stream might contain timeline markers, captioning metadata, camera metadata, and metadata about how successfully that data was transferred from the deck. Much of this data is very difficult to access in available software. 
so the packaging process we're using is intended to like interpret or move that data uh, to things like chapter tracks, uh, subtitle tracks, and embedded metadata within the container, which is much more accessible and usable in players like QuickTime X, uh, MPV, or VLC. When packaging DV into a container, the DV data is copied as is uh, into the QuickTime or Matroska file, and it just becomes the video track as it is uh, with the audio captions subtitles being kind of encapsulated along with it. In most cases, one DV tape will be captured to one DV data stream file and then packaged into one packaged file, one QuickTime or Matroska file. That is uh, one tape to one data stream to one container. But in some cases, th the changing characteristics of a DV recording might make this difficult. If we had uh, a DV file change from 4.3 to 16 by 9 aspect ratio, the packaging process might decide to, to split that up and make one, one contained file for the 4.3 part and one for the 16 by 9 part. Beyond segmenting files according to their technical characteristics, we also support options to segment files during packaging according to other recording events as well, like re recording start markers, uh, time code jumps. Andrew will present a little bit more on these kind of segmentation strategies later in the presentation. So I've presented on the script or the process we have called DV Packager before, but I'd like to give a bit of an update to our work. After our last presentation, we changed the default packaging output format from Matroska to QuickTime, as we found most of our users that were testing our work were using uh, QuickTime rather than Matroska, and it also seemed that nearly any environment that could play DV uh, could also play QuickTime, whereas this was a bit less true for Matroska. We also cleaned up the chapter titles so that now chapters uh, in a file are named after the source timecode and the camera recording timestamp. Uh, we've also added a method to determine if the output file should have stereo channels of audio or mono channels. While most DB tape is intended to have stereo paired audio channels with a left and a right, uh, sometimes DV is recorded differently and will have a different recording on each channel. Because DV just has four channels of audio, it doesn't necessarily express any clarity as far as how they are supposed to be arranged. Uh, we also put uh, more attention into DV Packager's handling of damage section of DV, uh, particularly in relation to audio. Um, often when DV tape is damaged, the audio won't be read properly, and then you can have a DV file where there are portions of the data stream that have video, but they don't have any audio. This has been a little tricky to manage because some container formats like QuickTime don't have a good method to store gaps in a audio track where there's just no audio at all, not silence, just no data. Um, so in the DV packager process, we have to identify where those gaps are, and we've um, we fit, the packaging process fills it with silence in, instead of an absence of audio in order to keep the output result synchronized and continuous. Because before we were finding problems where like FFmpeg would be sending out video, sending out audio, but all of a sudden you have these frames of video and no audio. And then when the audio came back, it would be just kind of be offset and there'd be like a, a gap or a synchronization issue from that point on. So by uh, covering those gaps of the silent audio, we're able to kind of manage uh, everything and keep it in sync on a, on a continuous timeline. We're also still finalizing work on DB packagers. Um, so we've been adding a lot of verification and testing into it so that we can make sure the output is as expected. Um, so we track packaging errors that can happen with very damaged or very unexpected DB data streams. Um, the, the main kind of uh, errors that we've been finding is when the output file is missing altogether because DB Packager is constructing a command to FFmpeg that it isn't able to actually process to make the output file. Or we find files that sometimes have a different duration for the audio and video track where they're intended to be the same. Another kind of error is that sometimes the output file doesn't contain the same number of frames as the input file. So in these three cases, like we we're doing all the post testing after the packaging process to make sure everything worked appropriately and to note when it didn't. As we've been working more and more on DB Packager and with exceptional files from like our testing users, 
we've been able to like substantially reduce the amount of problems that uh, come up in the packaging process. Um, but we still have all these like little verification steps in place to identify when they do. Because our goal is to have uh, packaged, clarified, and interoperable QuickTimer Matroska files that are also able to recreate the original DB data stream if needed. Uh, so that's the update on DB Packager. Uh, this exists as a command line script uh, that can be run with all the options and has also had been recently integrated into the graphical user interface uh, that we're developing so that you can take .db files and package them into containers with the segmentation options you prefer. Thanks. Okay, time to talk about some of the cool developments that Dave has been alluding to regarding segmentation capabilities within DB Rescue. This is the ability to specify new rules around segmentation for your tape capture by even more criteria than before, including aspect ratio and sample rate, which can help with a lot of the messiness that can occur in DB. These options and their integration into the GUI allow decisions to be made to get the best possible results for various potential use contexts. To help illustrate some of these segmentation options, we will use a file that was shared by Morgan at Bayback that proved to be the perfect example to highlight segmentation developments, as well as having subject matter that delights my Pacific Northwest heart. Thanks, Morgan. This was a tape that was almost entirely filmed in a 4-3 aspect ratio, predominantly of fish underwater, but that also had very brief segments of footage edited in that were 16-9. These are of a bear. Additionally, the underwater footage at the beginning of the tape started with a 32 kHz sample rate with two active channels and two silent channels, but the majority of the material was at 48 kHz in stereo. This clearly causes issues in playback, as well as showed how variable the treatment of these kinds of files could be across various players. VLC, for example, was able to switch between aspect ratios on the fly while playing this file, but had issues with the change in sample rate. QuickTime, on the other hand, simply squished the bear down to 4.3. One presumes that any derivative files made from this input would also be subject to variable results depending on the tool used. This highlights some of the advantages to packaging DV in a container that can specify desired outcomes, as well as how necessary it is to have a tool that can help facilitate the creation of these outputs in a user-friendly way. So we've talked about how you can use the DV Rescue GUI to do analysis of both the video and audio error rates of your DV transfers, but now the tool allows even more granular analysis by segment. If you look at the upper right of this image, you will see the segmenting rules options. Currently, it is set to show segments that are divided up at each aspect ratio change. This gives us five individual segments, two of them of the 16-9 bear and the rest of the 4-3 salmon. As you can see, if you hover your mouse over a particular segment in the list, the relevant portion of the QC graphs will be highlighted. Additionally, double-clicking on one of these segments will scale the graph to only show the QC output for that specific segment, in this case, the 16-9 bear. These segmentation options really start to show their usefulness when it comes to creating package file outputs that are specific to your context. For example, if for your use case it was important to package your DV tape into each of its different components, such as if you were planning on re-editing it and wanted to use different stock footage of a bear, you could split this file on each of these aspect ratio changes and have five separate output files from your tape. Alternately, if you were wanting to just make access derivatives for posting on your online access repository, you could choose to use the option to specify the output ratio to the most common one used in the file. This would give us a single output file that would be locked to a single output ratio, in this case 4.3. As has been mentioned, this process wouldn't be altering the fundamental metadata of the underlying DV, just the file wrappers, so all the original aspect ratio information would still be present and the process would be reversible. One of the other options added for segmentation now is for changes of audio sampling rate. This is because of some issues that were discovered during user testing. Ben Turgis filed an issue in our GitHub issue tracker about massive amounts of unwanted segmentation during the packaging of some of his tapes. These DV tapes were made from edit sessions of DV content where DV title cards with silent four-channel audio were edited around DV recordings with two audio channels. Our DV packager process would break these up to produce separate files of the two-channel and four-channel content. However, we could see that having one continuous file was clearly preferable here. Thus, we adjusted the process in DV packager to normalize audio to the highest sample rate and highest channel count used. There's still an option shown here to package segments separately to preserve the sample rate, otherwise the content can be normalized to the highest one. We believe that providing all these options for segmentation as well as the ability to preview the effects of specific combinations of options in real time will prove a great aid in processing collections of DV and gives the flexibility needed to handle the vagaries of DV as a format. Okay. 
Now to talk briefly about how you can find information about both DB rescue usage and DB issues in general, both currently and moving forward. Right now, there are two locations that you can go to find information about DB rescue workflows, the documentation website and the Google Drive folder for doc development. Both of these are available from the main GitHub page as well as through the links here. Obviously, this being a video, these links aren't helpful to you right now, but we will upload our slides so that you can have a quick cheat sheet should you need it. We wanted to quickly note the difference between the two document locations as they stand now. The website is being developed as the ultimate final authority for the project, and as such may incorporate some instructions or things like installation that assume the completion of aspects of the project that are still in development. If you need information related to the current builds and version of DB Rescue, the Google Drive folder is probably your best bet, as it is oriented around the current status. If you are looking for what will be the final documentation, check out the website. Though the final website is still under development, it is en route to its final form as a multifaceted resource for DB preservation workflows and DB rescue usage. It is now regularly updating with the information being compiled by MePOP staff. This includes things like a glossary of DB related terms, DB deck information and links to manuals, as well as instructions on setting up and debugging a DB station. I also want to note that it would be impossible to discuss the state of this web documentation without giving a shout out to Ashley Bluer, who did all the initial prototyping and design. Finally, we want to strongly encourage you all to file issues about the documentation or other parts of the project if you see anything amiss or have any suggestions or needs. As the documentation is all in the process of being built, this is your chance to give input. Don't be shy. We love it when people point out our oversights, areas that can be improved, or places we have made silly spelling errors. This all can be done through the GitHub project page, and again, there is a link here that will be available in the shared slides. I mentioned earlier that the processes we're designing to capture DV from a tape to a file. Um, so I want to give an update on that work. Currently, the design of the capture process is in two pieces. The first is a receiver, and the second is a processor. Uh, the receiver varies a bit depending on what operating system we're supporting. So FFmpeg is used to read from a DV deck uh, to a computer on Windows and Linux or we have our own tools based off AB Foundation in Mac operating system. Uh, the second component I mentioned in the capture workflow is this processor, and that is in our DB Rescue command line tool. The role of the processor is to receive the frames, analyze them, and resulting from that analysis, take some type of action. Normally that would be writing it to a file, um, but it could also be um, adjusting how the frames are received or controlling the deck. So one tool I mentioned in our Spring EMEA presentation was a method to allow that processor to receive multiple copies of the same DV transfer uh, so that it could merge them together into, in, in a process to create one better output. It could do this by relating all the frames of each copy, finding where the errors were, and replacing erroneous data in one copy with any better component of the additional copies for the same frame in the same position. DV tapes are finicky, so from one reading to another, they may have the same rate of errors, but the errors might be in different places. Um, in this image from our earlier presentation, I'm showing six transfers of the same tape where my friend Ben's face is, has some errors over it in each one. Those um, frames are then combined in the merge process to make like one better output. So lately, we've been combining the capture process and the merge process together to test workflows where we uh, capture a tape, rewind it, capture the same tape a second time, and then merge those two copies together to make a better result. But it takes about double the time. So the, the new process we're experimenting with is having the processor identify the errors and selectively retry portions of the tape while capturing. First, the software begins capturing DV frames. Uh, and looking for errors as it does. When an error is account encountered, such as an audio dropout or video error concealment, uh, then the processor begins to look for the next frame that does not have an error. When it gets to a good frame, then it stops and it rewinds to the place before the error started. And then it starts reading from the tape again until it gets to where the error ended. Uh, then it rewinds one more time and reads from there and then keeps going until the next errors. So in computer memory, then, we're managing three different readings of an errored section and combining the best parts of each to make one better output. Having this triple take on sections of known er errors gives us a more accurate output than is possible in a single take. 
Uh, and in this clip, you can see the triple take in action on this deck, which is showing a preview of the image and the time code. Uh, so you can see as it's playing along, the software notices the error and begins a process of rewinding to do this kind of triple take pattern, where a section of the tape is reread multiple times as the continuous capture process continues. Uh, we're still experimenting with this and might add a step in where we try to read the frames during the rewind step two to gain the most opportunities to read uh, from an errored section of tape with the least amount of wear. Um, as we're wrapping this up, we hope to merge this into the GUI soon. Uh, we're still kind of working on what we need to do to set up uh, the GUI so that the player can play frames that are held in memory um, so the user can see what the deck is doing as it's capturing. Um, but this is one of the parts of the project we're most excited about, where we have the computer kind of selectively controlling and intervening uh, with the deck um, to make the best output it can. The work completed for DB Rescue has unearthed a broader need in the archival community to expand current analog workflows to address the unique characteristics and issues that impact a variety of additional digital videotape formats. Thanks to renewed financial support from NEH, our new project, Digital Video Commander, will build on our findings during the early stages of DB Rescue. This expansion project will entail two additional years of work to develop open source and freely available software, user research and testing, and create documentation to help define and perform comprehensive, automated, and easy-to-use data migration techniques. We will continue working with nine partner institutions currently collecting digital videotape to conduct research, define preservation workflows, establish standards, and develop the most impactful tools for capturing content from these additional digital videotape formats, as well as enhance the tools created as part of DB Rescue. Digital videotape deserves and requires a fundamentally different approach. Whereas calibration of the signals from a played analog videotape are essential prior to digitization to ensure ensure that the resulting digital file represents the full quality and potential of the recording. Such manipulation is detrimental to playing back digital videotape since it is already digital. Adjusting the brightness, color, or volume of a digital videotape may still be helpful. However, such adjustments could be more easily applied to a resulting digital file, whereas not calibrating an analog videotape could result in irrevocable loss. A researcher within the DB Rescue project has proven opportunities to preserve DB tapes more reliable by developing software that works with the videotape player to gather the more accurate and complete representation of the DV tape's contents. By applying a similar process as sector-based disk migration, we believe we'll be able to capture a more complete file from other digital videotapes. As indicated by the name, the process operates by copying the source file sector by sector, re-scanning as it encounters an error. Rather than simply recording a file of what a video player is presenting, the recording software coordinates the entire process by assessing the data continuously, controlling the player to make second attempts as needed or guiding the user through easy to follow corrective actions. The Digital Video Commander project extends these findings from DV to all digital videotape formats. As Libby noted, one of the central discoveries of the DV Rescue project has become a stepping stone for the new Digital Video Commander project that we're just beginning work on. We found that we can improve the migration of DV data from DV tape by selectively rereading parts of the tape of errors more than once and combining the results according to the embedded error status information. So we'll be working to extend this approach to formats such as beta cam, uh, digital Betacam, Betacam SX, and HDCam. This project has shown us a new concept of transferring data from videotape. The traditional approach involves an assembly line of processes where the videotape plays a signal that the computer receives and records. In this new approach, the computer software orchestrates the capture event, commanding the video deck to play, receive, and evaluate the content and request the deck to rewind and retry if errors are found. And or orchestrates like receiving frames and deck control evaluation to come up with the best output possible. So rather than the computer diligently writing all the data it receives, the software is more active and controls the deck as needed, potentially in multiple passes, in order to make the transfers more accurate than would be possible in a single pass. With this approach, the software could even stop writing the data and ask the user to clean the deck if uh, head clogging issues are detected, and then synchronize the tape back to where it left off and continue. With DV, the error codes are clearly embedded within the DV stream that's transferred over Firewire, and each frame is identified with those time codes and absolute track numbers. With formats such as Digital Betacam and Betacam SX, which would be transferred over SDI, 
There, is, there are new challenges in doing the work to identify the tape transfer errors and determining the identity of every frame so that we can match frames across multiple passes. And then we also need to create a new open, reproducible, and accessible way to do deck control. Um, so that's one of the earliest challenges in this project that we started to address. Uh, so I'd like to go into that in a bit more detail. So in the DV Rescue project, we used a variety of tools such as DVCont and our own development to send control codes over Firewire uh, to the deck to do two things. The first would be to control the deck, such as making it take action, such as stop, play, rewind, and fast forward. Uh, the second thing that this uh, interaction does is query the deck, um, asking it for information like the model name, the time code of the current frame, and the settings of the deck. So we have this kind of interaction resolved with DV in the DV Rescue project, but we, we need to do this with digital Betacam decks, Betacam SX decks, and others. Um, so in order to use a computer to control a deck, often we're using a video capture card. So for instance, the Blackmagic Ultra Studio offers a remote output, so you can connect the Ultra Studio Express to the deck with a nine pin cable, and then you can control the deck from your computer using Blackmagic software or tools that are integrating Blackmagic software development kit. But many modern capture cards don't have this remote option. And we're, interesting, we're interested in reducing the dependency on specific uh, pieces of proprietary hardware to perform deck control and to create a more affordable, approachable uh, solution, uh, potentially independent from video capture. Uh, so we worked with a developer who had created a set of code for performing deck control uh, with an Arduino. Um, at this GitHub repository. So we approached um, Heideke to see about extending uh, the work here to remove the Arduino dependency. Um, which, because we wanted to get to the smallest set of hardware uh, possible to have a computer and a deck interact together. So eventually through collaboration, sponsor development, lots of testing and building upon other open source building blocks, um, we eventually developed a command line program that was able to do deck control with a specific set of hardware. This is what our prototype cable looked like. Uh, this uses a USB to RS-422 adapter, a DE 9-pin breakout board, and then uh, jumper cables that I borrowed from my son's Raspberry Pi kit uh, to connect the two devices together with a custom mapping uh, that would work with the Sony 9-pin protocol. So from here, we hope to publish two recipes for building this setup. One would be a, kind of a simpler, easy build uh, that's a bit messy with a short list of parts, but would only require a screwdriver to assemble, making something looking very similar to our prototype. The second recipe we would write <clears throat> would require more skill for um, uh, wiring, but produce a very tidy cable. Uh, here we would use the USB to RS-422 adapter, um, and then make a custom cable using nine pin wire, and then two of these nine pin breakout connectors. Um, and then we would have the wiring kind of interact with the connectors to perform the mapping. From here, we'd be able to, to integrate this kind of deck control into video capture software, such as V-Record, uh, DV Rescue, and other tools. Um, but it would require a bit more work. So hopefully we can get some like IKEA style uh, instructions on like the parts you need, the tools you need, and how to, to build it, whether you're making the more like screwdriver only approach or you're actually doing the wiring. Um, but so with this deck control, like we'll be able to like integrate that into our software so that if we're capturing and detect errors, we can ask the deck to rewind, get a second pass, compare the two, um, pick from the best, output the frames, and continue. Uh, so we'll be releasing that soon, um, later this year, like instructions if you want to build your own cable and the software to do deck control. Um, the other thing I wanted to show off here is like, be, beyond just controlling the deck, we also want to query it for information. Um, so in our query results right now, this is how we're detecting the information that comes back from the deck. So it tells us information about if the deck is in local or remote mode, if the tape is in there, um, what the mode is of the tape, like if it's actively playing or fast forwarding. Um, we're able to ask for various types of time code. So uh, we're really excited to like get this kind of raw information back from the deck and determine like how we're going to use that and capture it 
before or during a transfer.